Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for today's virtual media briefing about COVID-19 in London and Middlesex County. We're joined today by the Acting Mayor of London, Jesse Helmer, and the Medical Officer of Health and CEO of the Middlesex London Health Unit, Dr. Chris Mackey. We'd like to welcome the media who are in attendance for this afternoon's briefing and invite them to submit their questions using the question forum here on Microsoft Teams. Just a reminder for those asking questions this afternoon to please indicate your name and media outlet. We'd also like to welcome those viewers tuning in on Rogers Television, Rogers Facebook page and YouTube channel, as well as those listeners on Global News Radio and those watching on the CTV London website. We'll get to the opening statements right away and we'll start with the Acting Mayor of London, Jesse Helmer. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Beth. Uh, just a couple of uh, Friday updates uh, from me. First, um, with the uh, heat warning in effect for the next couple of days, I wanted to remind people that uh, the City of London pools and aquatic facilities will actually begin opening for the season tomorrow. Uh, so starting tomorrow, the Canada Games Aquatic Centre, uh, the South London Community Pool, uh, Thames Park Community Pool will be open to the public. Uh, as of Monday, uh, Byron Gibbons, Westminster, Stronach Pools uh, will open as well as a few of the waiting pools. And then Southcrest, Northeast, uh, Northridge, Silverwood, they're scheduled to open next Saturday. So uh, some relief on the way if you're a, a person who loves to swim. Uh, of course, all the guidelines and health precautions that have been set out by the province of Ontario and our own Middlesex London Health Unit, uh, including physical distancing, group size restrictions, uh, those are all being in place at the aquatic uh, facilities. Um, and and a reminder, the splash pads and spray pads are already open and those are operating from 9 a.m. till 9 p.m. Uh, seven days a week. I do want to mention as well that downtown and in, in Old East Village, there are some agencies that are providing cooling spaces, uh, bottled water, other refreshments for our most vulnerable. Um, second thing I wanted to mention is just a very significant piece of infrastructure work that is happening downtown. Uh, starting Monday, work is getting underway replacing the King Street uh, sewer, which is over 100 years old. This is part of a sewer separation project, which will help reduce uh, sewer overflows into the Thames River uh, over time and also support further intensification downtown. This is obviously a necessary a piece of work, but it is going to require the closure of Richmond and King uh, until early September while that work is ongoing. As you can imagine, digging out the sewer is a big undertaking that uh, creates a big hole in the ground. So we're going to have to close the whole thing for a while. Um, as the construction is taking place, we're going to make sure that everybody can move around um, that area. We want to do everything we can to support the businesses that are operating in that area um, and to support people getting down there, whether they're coming on foot or taking the bus or riding their bike uh, or driving down. Um, and so there will be a lot of efforts by the city to make sure that uh, the construction project goes as smoothly as it possibly can. I ask for everybody's patience as we're working through that over the next few months uh, in the middle of also the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So that's it for me on uh, a warm uh, Friday afternoon. I'm going to turn it over to the Medical Officer of Health. Dr. Mackey, take it away. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, so we haven't talked uh, about our provincial numbers for a few days because of, uh, you know, Canada Day on Wednesday and then the uh, press conference about the HPPA yesterday. Uh, so I want to make sure that uh, we do because they've been quite reassuring. Provincially over the last three days, 165, 153 and 149 cases. Uh, locally, just two new cases announced today, uh, one yesterday and zero announced on Canada Day. Uh, so our numbers locally and provincially both uh, trending very much in the right direction. Once again, no deaths today. The last death was June 10th related to coronavirus. And um, so now over over three weeks uh, without any deaths in, in, these, in our communities. Uh, there was a question that came in uh, earlier today uh, through uh, one of our media partners about the two new cases today. They are both associated with healthcare, uh, but we're not de declaring an outbreak in either case. And how could that possibly be since the provincial case defini outbreak definition uh, requires just one case in uh, retirement home or long-term care in order to generate an outbreak? Well, the provincial case definition did uh, adjust 
I want to say about two weeks ago. So there is flexibility to interpret uh, a single case locally. Uh, and we've taken advantage of that in these two situations and uh, at least one over one other situation in the last couple of weeks uh, because uh, of a number of factors. First of all, uh, the individuals who tested positive in both cases are not, uh, have never been symptomatic. Uh, so these are not people who were symptomatic and then uh, tested positive. They're not people who uh, have become symptomatic since the test. Uh, they're people who have never been symptomatic. That's a sign that if they were positive, um, it would be likely at a low level of disease. It also could be a sign that they were a false positive. And so um, when you're making the decision about uh, putting a whole long-term care retirement home into outbreak, uh, it's a significant decision. And of course we do that when we need to. Uh, but in this situation, we think the risk is very low. The other things that contribute to the low risk, uh, first of all, the staff members are able to isolate at home uh, regardless of uh, us believing that these are likely to be false positives. Second of all, um, the, um, the, the actual test result itself, now that our labs are at higher capacity, uh, there's actually more information that comes from the PCR testing than just whether it's positive or not. And this is a really important point. point. The PCR is a system that uh, essentially uses enzymes to copy the, the DNA of, um, of the organism that you're looking for. And the cycle time, which is about how long it takes to replicate that um, DNA sample to the point where the, labs, the uh, lab equipment can detect it, uh, is an important indicator of how much DNA there was uh, initially in the sample. And so the cycle times for both of these cases were very high. That means there was only a tiny, tiny bit of uh, virus in the sample, which again can be on the one hand, it could indicate this is, these are false positives. On the other hand, it could indicate that even if positive, they're very, very unlikely to be infective. And uh, the other factor here, both these uh, uh, staff are going for second test and will stay isolated at home until that uh, second test result is available. So uh, essentially risk to the staff and uh, patients in those facilities is, um, is non-existent related to these cases. Uh, as you know, there is screening of long-term care and retirement home workers, uh, as well as hospital workers on a regular basis now. Uh, so we're getting uh, tens of thousands of test results every couple of weeks related to that screening uh, across uh, the Southwest region. And what that means is that you know, even when there are, there is absolutely no uh, virus in the community, we would still get false positives out of that. That's what we think has happened in both of these cases. Again, taking all precautions to make sure that those people isolate until a second test result is available. Uh, I will pause there. Oh, there's one other important thing actually I wanted to mention uh, before taking further questions. We have developed a question and answer document related to the HPPA uh, Section 22 order uh, that we announced yesterday. Uh, that Q&A document has been up uploaded to healthunit.com, uh, the Middlesex London Health Unit website, uh, just this afternoon. Happy to take any questions, Beth. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Mackey, Acting Mayor Helmer, for the opening statements today. We do have a few questions in the queue already, so we'll get to those right away. The first question here comes uh, from Carrie McKee with CBC London. This question is for you, Dr. Mackey. Carrie would like to know, if the Premier asks if Middlesex London is ready for stage three of reopening, what would you say? What would be your biggest concern? So uh, I think we're in a very good position. The numbers here have been very low, uh, even in spite of stage two reopening, which happened uh, what, a little over three you know, weeks ago now. And uh, the, um, what would be the uh, biggest concerns? So, it, so first of all, those uh, high risk settings where there is close contact happening uh, for 15 minutes or more, face-to-face uh, -face less than two meters apart. Uh, those settings have the potential to generate outbreaks, even in a low risk, uh, low prevalence, you know, where there's very little virus in the community. We could still see outbreaks where people are uh, in close contact with a lot of others. Uh, the second concern, of course, is our neighboring jurisdiction of uh, Windsor-Essex. Uh, tremendous things happening there to be able to control 
the spread of coronavirus in communities there, um, but having significant numbers uh, still reported in the Essex County areas is uh, a concern. And we know that the 401 quarter uh, moves people very efficiently. And uh, ideally, we, we, we hope it's not also going to be moving um, that issue up from, from that part of the province to here. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. The next question here is for the acting mayor. This comes from Dan Brown with the London Free Press. This is a three-part question for the acting mayor. The mayor has spoken in past briefings about warnings being issued to people using playground equipment in city parks, despite it being cordoned off with caution tape. Why do you suppose people can't resist using playground equipment? When will playground equipment be usable again by park goers? And do you suppose the problem is really adults, not kids? Uh, thank you. Uh, I see that uh, all the tough questions come uh, my way uh, and Dr. Mackey gets off easy. Um, so, well, I mean, when I was a kid, uh, I know why I wanted to get on playground equipment and that was because I, I really enjoyed swinging around and climbing on things and rolling around in the dirt. And uh, I mean, kids want to do stuff like that. And I think that's going to be the case uh, regardless of what's going on in the world with coronavirus. Um, you know, that desire to do those things is going to be there for kids. And so, you know, obviously it's, um, on parents to look out for their kids when they have desires to do things that are not good for them. They have to intervene and say, look, I know you want to do that, but you can't. And these are why, these are the reasons why. And I think that we're going to be constantly dealing with this issue because uh, playground equipment is fun to play on. Kids want to do things that are fun and we're going to have this, uh, this issue uh, as long as we're restricting access to the playground equipment. In terms of when that will happen, uh, when you know it'll be okay to go back on. I think we have to look to public health and, and to the advice we're getting around the spread of disease. And as we learn more about it and we have a different situation on the ground, we can make changes to allow people to get onto playground equipment. And I think we just have to make that in an evidence-based way, um, taking our cue from what we're hearing from uh, uh, folks like Dr. Mackey. So, you know, right now, uh, people should stay off equipment that's cordoned off. Don't be taking down the caution tape. Uh, don't be climbing on the equipment. It's not allowed yet. Um, and uh, I know that's going to be difficult for uh, for folks in the community, but it's important uh, that we follow that advice and we don't climb on the playground equipment. Thank you very much, Acting Mayor Helmer, for uh, for that response. The next question comes from Dan Brown with the London Free Press as well. This is for Dr. Mackey. Dr. Mackey, what is the risk of infection from using playground equipment in city parks? High, medium, or low? At what point will you feel comfortable recommending that Londoners can use playgrounds in city parks again? Yeah, so um, we recommended to our municipal partners to uh, close their play playgrounds. I, if I remember correctly, it was within a day or two of the provincial announcement uh, of that closure across the province. So I think we're really aligned with uh, the province in terms of the timing and the degree of safety needed. Uh, the the biggest issue with playground equipment is not the playground equipment, it is the children being in close proximity. Uh, and so, you know, the, the virus uh, can survive on equipment, but in general, in, especially in sun uh, and in hot weather, uh, that uh, it, it can dry out quickly and, uh, and that usually kills the virus within a couple of hours. Um, but if you if you have children gathering and in close contact, uh, that potentially is spreading the infection not through equipment but from child to child. So that's the biggest concern. Uh, and I would think that as we see rates continue to drop across the province and, and stage three reopening occurs, uh, that you will see those uh, playground equipment come back into service. Thank you very much, Dr. Mackey, for that response. That leaves us with no more questions in the queue for this afternoon. I did want to let everyone know that the question and answer web page, though, that Dr. Mackey did mention in his opening remarks this afternoon, the link to that page has been posted in the um, Q&A chat as well. So you should be able to follow the link through that announcement that I just made. Uh, with no further questions, that will conclude the virtual media briefing for this afternoon. We will join you back here again on Monday at two o'clock. So I'd like to thank you, Dr. Mackey, Acting Mayor Helmer, and to all the viewers out there for joining us this afternoon. Have a great day.